Hey guys, thanks for tuning into my video. This is going to be about how to pour and stamp a concrete patio slab. Now this is part three. In part one and two, we did the we did the slab out front, poured it, stamped it, and now we're adding on to the side of the house here. And then they're going to end and eventually they're going to end up putting a pool over there where the concrete truck is. So we'll come back and do the pool deck around the pool after that's done. But in this video, I just wanted to go over a little bit about how we end up, you know, we, the homeowner actually did the form in here. We did the rebar. We put the poly up on the house. We got ISO strip up against the, the house foundation. So it's a half inch piece of foam that goes up against the house foundation. So the concrete patio slab doesn't stick to the house slab. And then this here is just us going through the, the pouring uh, technique that we use. The mix we use, uh, we, we like using the fiberglass rebar and stuff like this, tied it at a two foot mat on center. And the mix I like using for stamping, we use a 4000 PSI mix. It's got fiber mesh in it also, it's got air entrainment in it, it's got water reducer in it, so it's a really good strong mix. The P-Stone makes it a little bit easier to stamp, I feel, that's why we don't use the three quarter stone. For stamping and the water reducer allows us to pour the mix you know really what I call a really nice workable mix easy to work with easy to rake around easy to mag easy to screed so that's the that's the key for us using that water reducer in all our mixes and it helps keep the concrete good and strong too so you don't have to really use water to get a workable mix Now this patio is about 36 feet long here by 12 feet wide. It's early in the morning too. It's like 6 a.m. in the morning. This company that we pour with, they like getting concrete out early because they got, they got a really busy schedule, you know, just like most people. And they know we pour pretty quick and dump the truck right out and get it back. So they, they get us concrete at 6 a.m. <laughs> So we'll be done pouring here before 7 a.m. Now I'm using those plastic forms. Those are our poly metaforms. We get them from a company in Wisconsin. If you wanna, if you wanna check them out, those are really nice forms. They have rigid ones. They have bendable ones. They go together really nice. Um, and then they have, they have these clamps you can click on to pound your metal stakes through that that are adjustable, so you can adjust your forms up and down. And then if we need, you know, if we have a form, we don't want to cut them. They, they do come in 12 foot lengths, but they got those two metal pieces sticking out so you can connect them together. So if we need something, let's say exactly 12 feet or a little under, we usually use a two by four for that. So since we had to adjust the truck, you know, we had to move the truck over to the next section. We stopped the pour and then we'll get this part screeded instead of just dumping it all out like we normally do. So we'll screed this part out. One guy can screed off the form since we set the forms to grade. Then the other guy, Darren, on the inside, he's kind of what we call wet screed and he's kick screeding. So as he moves backwards, he kicks a little bit of mud into where his footprint was. And that allows him just to keep screeding without stopping. And then me and Luke right behind him, actually there's two Lukes. <laughs> the young Luke is way in behind, but me and Luke are kind of what we call puddling in behind the screed. So we just want to make sure them guys don't get low, but also not too high. They want a little bit high, like that little roll they're pulling back right now is just exactly what they want as they're screeding. And then that fills in really nicely under the screed as they pull it back. And it'll make bow floating a lot easier too. So well, the guy on the outside of the screed, he's kind of matching the stroke and the speed of the guy on the inside. So the guy on the inside kind of dictates, you know, how far he wants to pull the screed to him and then how fast he wants to go. That's how we do it anyway. Just make screeding. The guy on the inside usually job is a little bit harder than the guy on the outside. All right, it's time to get the rest of this poured. You can see how nice that mix flows when you have it just at the right slump you wanted. It flows out the chute nice. 
rakes around really easy. You can get it raked to grade. Then bow float makes it nice. If you watch the bow float here, it's pretty much just one time down and back, and then you got a nice smooth surface. And that's kind of what we want just before we stamp. We'll have one more process you'll see here coming up really shortly in the video. Before we stamp, we'll we'll actually go over it again, the surface, and make sure it looks really nice. We like it when the, you know, we don't get too many front dumps where we are, so we'll use the tailgate trucks like this one right here. So I'll basically just control the chute. I'll control the speed of the concrete coming out the chute. I'll tell the truck driver when to pull ahead if he needs to back up. That way I'm in control of things, and I can control things a little bit better than the, than the truck driver. He can't really read our minds. He doesn't know exactly what we want. So it actually works out pretty good that... You know, we get the tailgate ones. It, sometimes it just makes pouring a little bit easier. Otherwise, the, the guys on the front dumps tend to, they either tend to get too much concrete where you want it or maybe not enough. Very rarely do you get a driver that knows exactly how much concrete you want. So it just makes pulling the concrete around a little bit harder sometimes. Now Darren and I are screeding. Eric's bow floating. If you watch Eric, when he pulls that bow float back, just watch how nice and smooth and flat it is under that bow float. Now the slab slopes away from the house about an inch, but there's no dips or humps under that bow float when he's bow floating. That means you've done a really good job screeding, done a really good job setting the forms also. But that's kind of what you're looking for. You don't want to have to shovel concrete back in under the bow float after you bow float. If you're doing that, then there's something wrong with your screeding. You're just not getting your screeding down right. This is a good shot of me kick screeding right there. Just tiny little steps backwards. But usually that means that, you know, we don't have to stop unless maybe the concrete's too low or the concrete's too high. Or maybe your edge doesn't get magged. But there again, see how I'm just kicking that in there as I go? Just takes a little bit to fill that hole up where your feet was. Now in this part three, you're also going to get to see us stamp this. Unlike parts one and two, part one was just about us pouring. Part two was about us stamping. This one I'm going to have with the pour and the stamp in both since it's just this one side of the house. And then I'm going to have a little bit of the finished part two at the end where we actually wash it and we, we add the secondary color. It's called texture enhancer. So we'll texture enhance it. And you'll get to see, you'll get a pretty good look at what the whole slab, the front and the side is going to look like when everything's all said and done. Still really low down. If you want to learn a little bit about this stuff too, like if, if you're interested in concrete, you want to learn a little bit about it. Sure. I've got the Concrete Underground. The link for that is down below in the description. So you can check that link out. And i got a bunch of training videos in there. Plus, you get access to me in there. You can ask me questions. I can help you out with whatever you need. So that's inside the concrete underground, guys. Right now, Darren's daydreaming a little bit. <laughs> but we're going to get this finished. We'll get the screed done. Then we'll get all the tools cleaned up. And then you're going to see, you know, what the next process is here just before we go stamping. This process is really kind of what sets the the pros apart from the from the beginners is this next thing we're going to do right here. So right now we're just finishing up the pour. Darren and I are cleaning up the edge where we screeded. Eric will finish bull floating. And then what we like is, you know, we like just a little bit of downtime in between the pour and then before we have to stamp. Then we can get it all organized. You know, we can get all the stamps out, we can get the release out, we can get the finished tools out. Yeah, you can see how really nice that surface looks after we bow float. That's what you're looking for right there. Like, that's the key. One of the keys is getting a really nice finished surface after you get done bow floating. That's going to make this process right here a little easier. Now, if you're not doing this before you're stamping, if you're just, if you're just trying to stamp over your bow float, then you're missing a key part of, you know, getting a really good looking quality stamp product. 
So what this does is just tightens up the surface a little bit more. It brings a little more paste to the surface, knocks down any little bit of aggregate that might still be left at the surface. It gets rid of, if you do have bow float lines, it'll get rid of the bow float lines. And what I'm doing is I'm getting on my skids, my knee boards, and I'm going to just, you know, do this one little edge right here. I'm going to fill that in edge in so it looks nice and tight to the previous pour. And I do the same thing up against the house while Luke is using what we call the that little red funny float. He can, he'll reach out and get as much as he can with that. But sometimes it's hard to get right up against the house and get it really good. So you got to get on there by hand to do it. Uh, you can see right there, that's a good shot of Luke, you know, just what he can do with the little hand funny float using the poles. Eric and Luke are doing the, the edge, and we like to round the edge, and then we'll mag out. If we leave an edge mark, we'll mag that edge mark out, but we'll just leave the rounded edge. And there I am. I'm, now I'm on the skids, and I'm getting up next to the house. There's always, you know, a little bit of a what we call a I don't know roughness or a gap or a tiny little bit up against the house between the house and the actually the concrete and the iso foam that we use I'll get a good shot of it right here I think right there see that and that's what you want to fill in right there and flatten that out make it look really nice see how I'm filling that in right there like if you don't fill that in if you just stamp over it that that just really doesn't make for a really good end product and then as I go, I'm just kind of taking out my marks from my skids, making sure that's all filled in really good. And then that's basically, you know, once I jump off, and you can see Darren up back, he's starting to put the liquid release on. Once I jump off the skids and mag my marks out, then that surface right there is ready to stamp when we're ready to rock and roll here. And it's only been probably, you know, 20, 30 minutes after the pour, so this stuff... In the middle of the summer when it's 80, 85 degrees, this stuff sets up fast, so you don't have too much time to waste. You gotta really be on board with what you what you're doing, have your stamps organized, you know, make sure you release and you have have a sprayer and you have a backup sprayer and just be ready to go. Because you gotta get from one end to the other, you know, in a very short amount of time. Let's say maybe twenty minutes, you gotta get from one end to the other here without that stuff setting up too far the concrete setting up too much right at the end and having to really pound your texture in so we're using a we use a variety of rollers sometimes just to kind of like pre texture the slab before we put the stone texture stamp mats on it we like to pre texture the slab a little bit and we find if we have time to do this that just helps get a little bit of added texture to the slab you can see right there how that works. Now you don't have to go crazy. You just just adding a little bit of texture to the surface, and that'll just enhance the texture you'll get from the stamping mats if you can do that. We have some that just have like a stone texture, and we have some that just have a slate texture. Sometimes we'll use both. But what the rollers don't have that the stamping mats do, the stamping mats have like those veins in them, as you can see when you look at the bottom of the stamp. Or if you look at when we pull the stamp back up off the concrete, they got the veins built into the mat, so that makes the that makes the concrete look really a lot more like stone than just using the roller itself. We have multiple different stone textured stamps, so that's why that's why you see a bunch of different ones there. We like to just mix and match all of them, make sure none of the pattern gets repeated anywhere. And then as we go, you know, we'll just keep rolling texture on the surface ahead of ourselves. And we also have a, a little one, a nine inch roller we can use to get up against the house. And then as we pull the stamps up, you know, we're looking behind where we pulled just in case we gotta, we gotta roll a little uh, texture onto a, maybe a small spot that we thinks need to be touched up. So we kind of have a touch up roller also. Having plenty of guys is key too, you know, that way you can have a couple guys around the outside kind of rolling and stamping the edges for you in advance, adding some some uh, liquid release in front of you in advance. So the guys just 
putting the texture on the concrete, pulling the mats up, and moving them. That's all they really got to do. They don't have to worry about doing much else. Just makes things move along a little quicker. Now I got some what we call stamping shoes on. They're just flat soled shoes. They're actually called shoe ins. You can step right inside them with your sneakers or your boots. And they have a really flat sole. Plus they distribute your weight a little bit better on top of these really thin stone texture stamps. And they just make stamping a little bit easier. You can even, you know, we're using just the weight of our bodies to stamp in the texture right now. That means the concrete is is soft enough to take texture, soft enough to take our weight without having to tamp it in with a tamper. So this is basically how we do it. You know, there's this 12 feet wide is is uh, just wide enough really for two guys. I mean, three guys could get on here if we really needed a third guy. But basically two guys just moving back and forth, staying out of each other's way, working together. Now Luke jumped on just to help speed things up a little bit. See, we just got out of that part in the sun. Now we're moving back into the shade. So I, I think we're going to be fine as far as the concrete not setting up on us too fast. And then Eric and young Luke, they're, they're working the edges around the outside for us, just keeping those textured in, in advance. The nice thing about that roller, the little roller texture, is we can roll right up next to the house. If you don't have the roller, then you got to use, you got little smaller, like two foot by two foot texture mats you can put down there, but it's just a little bit slower using them. Or if, if you don't have them, then you may have to you know bend those bend those flexible bigger mats up the house to get right up next to the edge and that just makes things a little harder sometimes now so far everything's moving along pretty nicely on us I think now we had we had concrete ordered for this the day after we did the front part that we did the front part on a Monday but then it ended up raining. So it rained Tuesday, it rained Wednesday, it rained Thursday. So this is actually a Friday. So there's three days in between the concrete. Now, all this time, that front part, the front concrete patio has been curing and turning lighter and lighter shades of gray <laughs> compared to this one. So normally our process is poured, stamp, come back the next day, you know, early the next day, saw, cut in your joints, wash it. And then let that dry and then and it will teak wash it too. let that dry and then come back the next day and seal it so basically three days in a row well now we can't do that because we got to let this one cure out for at least three or four days to try to get as light of color as the front patio that's been already sitting there for a while you know we don't want to seal the front one and this one without them being almost exactly the same color so that's kind of why we like to pour you know if we're making two pours we like to pour back to back on stuff like this that's a good shot of just touching up some texture in different little different areas before we decide we're all done you know that's that's what being fussy is all about making sure everything really looks nice taking some time really caring about what you do Darren's pretty fussy he likes everything to look just so and I mean, so am I Yeah, it looks pretty good. Definitely looks like stone texture. I will clean up and get out of here for today. That should be good. It'll harden up pretty fast now. That sun's going to be coming around this afternoon. And like I said, we'll probably give it all day tomorrow. Let it cure out. Try to catch up to the whiteness of that, even though it's got gray in it. It's got to lighten up a lot. And then maybe Sunday I'll come back and wash it. Keep wash both. We'll see what it looks like Sunday. Might. I know Monday and Tuesday next week look like 90 degrees, so that's probably not going to be the best time to teak wash something like this. But we'll just have to just have to work through it, try to get them both to match up the best we can. Now this was about a week later, as you can see, the one down the side really cured up and lightened up, really nice to match the front. 
So this was this is really the next process. Me and Darren, we you know, we'll rinse off any residual of that liquid release we use. We'll we'll scrub it with a little Dawn dish detergent, kind of like washing a car. And that cleans the surface off really nice. And then the next process is we'll mix up mix up our texture enhancer. You know, this comes as a powder. We put about three or four gallons in a five gallon bucket of water and then we put a couple scoops of that powdered texture enhancer. We're using two colors here. We got charcoal and then we got dark gray. We just kind of, we just kind of, you know, you can see I'm in the back. I'm just kind of putting it on for Darren, just very, uh, very liberally. And then he's kind of coming behind me and just kind of brushing it out making it look uh, you know somewhat even and then it'll just that stuff will settle in the lower spots and then the rest of it kind of kind of evaporates off you can see it's kind of gray on the higher spots and darker on the lower spots and that's kind of what it's going to look like after you seal it I didn't get a really good shot of us sealing this but after you seal it it darkens up the concrete surface to look like this the it enhances the darker spots and then it looks really nice thanks for watching guys we'll see you on the next one